It's Friday, September 7th, 2018. This is Layla Burrell. I'm at the Stonewall Inn with Stacey Lentz to talk with her for the Stonewall Orchestry Project. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really excited about this. That's great. So can you tell me where and when you were born yep. and something about how you grew up? Yep, sure. I was born in Bendina, Kansas, uh, April 17th, 1970. Um, it's a very small Christian conservative town. Uh, population about 110, and that's counting sheep, dogs, and cats. A uh, very rural, rural Americana. Um, and especially during that time period, it's very interesting to grow up in that kind of rural, Christian, conservative town, and then start to realize, oh my God, I'm different than everyone else here. <laughs> so, so that became very interesting for me over the course of, uh, of, of my life. And I think it kind of shaped me into wanting to be an activist, um, because I kind of understood what it was like to be that that, that, you know, gay teen growing up in that kind of environment where you knew you were different, but you didn't even know why or how because you didn't even know what a gay person was. There was zero visibility of the LGBTQ people in your community. If there happened to be another one, maybe. Um, and especially during that time frame, it was just not accepted and okay. And especially in, in small town Americana uh, during the, the 70s and 80s when I grew up. So can you tell me about your family? Sure. I have an older brother. Um, uh, and then I have my mom and dad are uh, very Christian conservative. My dad was a steel worker his entire life. Never missed a day of work except maybe when he took me to college. Uh, my mom was actually a secretary and then went back to college after I left and ended up becoming a VP of Human Resources. Uh, so, um, but again, very middle class, middle of nowhere, uh, borderline middle class poor. Um, I think it's interesting remembering about my childhood, a thing that probably made me aware of not just my LGBTQ identity, but just the world outside of that cornfield in that small town was the fact that we'd load up the car, uh, the old like, you know, 1977 station wagon, and, and even though they didn't have a ton of money, we traveled. They'd throw us in the back of the car and we'd go to the Grand Canyon. We would drive to Gettysburg to learn about the history of Gettysburg. We would drive to the Washington Monument. We would go everywhere to kind of learn. And it was always like a learning field trip. So they were very aware of education and the fact that they understood that even though they spent their whole life in that tiny, tiny town themselves, they were kind of born and raised there too, that it was important for their children to, to get out, learn about different cultures, learn about different places of history. And I think that really kind of shaped my brother into being vastly different than a lot of people in that small town who'd never had that exposure experience. So tell me about um, the role that religion played in your life when you were growing up. Sure. I was probably in church every Sunday, without a doubt. Uh, I went to Bible school since I was five. Uh, I was always in the church choir, not a good singer, but, uh, I, but I tried, right? So uh, I did those kind of things. Um, but it was very, very important. I think that was like an element, especially with my parents. Um, our high school was a public high school in, in Kansas. But even during that time period, a public high school in Kansas, mm, that had a lot of religion that shouldn't have been in there. Um, we prayed before games, basketball, football, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think uh, one year they even show, showed an anti-abortion film at, at 14, which is illegal. It wasn't even a true portrayal. We had fish every Friday. Um, which is also something you can't do, and that was because of the Catholicism of the town, even though I was raised Methodist. It was a very, very, religion played a huge part in, in, in my growing up and in my early childhood. And how do you remember yourself as a little girl? Yeah, I remember myself being very gregarious, very outgoing, kind of the same I feel now. <laughs> um, I still think I'm 17. Uh, you know, almost 50 going on 17. Um, but I think I remember myself being, you know, that, that you know, somewhat different, right? And, and I think that, you know, not being able to know what it was, not being able to pinpoint it, uh, different in a way of my thinking than, than the kids that were around me, different in a way about, I felt about not just my sexuality, but, but life and politics, all of it. I, I just felt like a, a, an outsider. Very popular kid, for sure. Always had people over at my house. My house was the hub of activity. You know, if I had a birthday party, kids from all over towns. I think I was throwing events, kind of what I do now in my life when I was like 12, you know. Um, so that was all good, but internally there was, a, there was turmoil and a struggle of why don't I fit in? Why don't I, you know, as this popular, outgoing, played every sport, super happy kid, most times outwardly inwardly there was some turmoil and struggle that I was trying to figure out as I started to figure out my sexuality 
figured out um, my the, what re role religion would play in that because I was very religious at that point. And also talking about the political struggles. I think when in kindergarten, when we had to vote for, we had like the mock voting, I was the only one who voted for Carter versus Ford, right? So there was already these leaning left liberal tendencies at five which I was like, where is this coming from? Because it's certainly not my environment. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just an interesting kind of, uh, kind of way of thinking that was very, vastly different. And did you feel like you had to work hard to hide that you felt different inside? I, I know. I don't think I really had to work, work that hard. I think it was something I just innately kept in. I think there was a part of me that didn't even, like I said, didn't know what it was. I also felt like I probably knew that if I would talk about that as I got into my teens, when I really started to figure out, wait, I like my best friend more than I should like my best friend, right? And I started to come to realize that. And again, you've got to remember that was in the early 80s, right? Vastly different than where we are with marriage equality and everything else, all these rights and freedoms that, you know, we got born at this place, right? So it, it was a different time period and a different era. So for me, it was very, very tricky. And I think I had acknowledged that I was starting to come into this, but I didn't, I didn't even, I don't know if I knew what it was, so I certainly didn't know how to hide it because I didn't even know what it was, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So there was no way to even know. I just knew it was something different, but I didn't know how to hide it because I didn't know what it was. But I also knew that like, I fought this harder than the other people around me would typically fight these struggles internally. And did you, um, when you were in school, like still living at home, yeah. at some point did you start looking for kids and see if you could like like, is there somebody else here who's like me? I don't even think, like I said, I go back to, I didn't know what that was. And I was not accepting it myself, right? I think I, I think as I got into my high school years, I dated a ton of guys to be like, to, to myself internally, again, never externally. Wait, I just, why haven't I fallen in love? Why am I not attracted to boys? I love them. I want to watch, go play football with them. I want to hang out. I want to be their best friend. I want to do these things. I love them, just like I love my guy friends now. But there was no romantic connection. So I think I dated a lot of guys trying to be like, no, I'm not gay. No, I'm not gay. You know, And those kind of things just to prove to myself. I think that internal struggle um, was more, more difficult than the outward struggle. And do you remember it being articulated to you, maybe from church or your sure. family, that it would not be okay? It would never be okay, right? So, and I think that happens not just to me, but everybody, right? And I think that still happens in, in rural American towns all around the country, and that's part of the problem. Language matters, right? And so we're having a conversation with a 12-year-old, and it could be a simple, something as simple as being like, that's so gay, all right? And we've all said that maybe you know, back when we were little or whatever, but that kind of stuff matters. So, so that's so gay. So that means if it's dumb or if it's effeminate or it's not accepted, you're labeling it. So we pick up on that. And I definitely picked up on that. And for me, it was worse than that. So gay. <laughs> maybe somebody would call someone the F word because they weren't masculine enough, right? Because you have to remember that type of environment. So I think it was definitely drilled into my head. Not only is this okay, this is so socially unacceptable that the, it, it was demonized, right? That this is like the devil, that you are a part of a, you would be part of a lifestyle or you, you just have to fight this. This is just not acceptable. This is not the way of God. This is not the way of anybody in our society. There's not anybody in our small town who feels this way. It's just not okay, like you, ever. So I think, yes, I picked that up early from church. I picked that early on from, from the surrounding of the school. And early on when there's a questionable people that maybe it was a woman who was too masculine who lived on the farm by herself. Oh, oh she's a lesbian, right? You know, those kind of whispers in, in, in those kind of Americana towns, right? So, and those kind of stereotypes. And it was like, oh, and so it was always a bad word. It was always a bad thing since I even started to understand it. So tell me about how that started to change. I don't think it changed until I went away and escaped that environment. Uh, I don't think it ever changed when I was there. I think all the way through high school, and then I even went, you know, I only went two hours away. I went to Kansas State, right, which is, again, 20,000 kids, pretty d decent public school in the Midwest, but um, I, I really didn't come across that. 
Um, I could have played softball and probably found, here we go, stereotypes, I could have probably played softball and found some on the softball team then, but I opted to join the sorority. So I, so I was fighting my own struggle even then, uh, and when I look back on that. So it was interesting. Um, so as even as I went to college, I didn't even see, you know, I was in a sorority, still tr continuously trying to be like, oh my God, just haven't found the right guy, all these kind of things, still in denial, but then really starting to, to, to figure that out. Then around my sophomore year of college, I went to the Berkshires to work at an all-girls summer private Jewish camp. Um, my brother at this point had escaped and he was living in DC, and I use the word escape but, um, uh, loosely because it was, it, was, it was a good place to grow up. It was just difficult when you have those struggles. The values, everything it taught me, I would never trade it for the world, but those internal struggles are there. He was living in DC, he had gone to George Washington University, his girlfriend had, had gone to summer camps and said, oh, and I was looking for somewhere my parents knew that I needed to get out at 19. So I began working that summer camp. So that gave me experience and exposure to kids from the East Coast. It gave me experience politically and just opened my mind to a whole other world. So I spent every summer, even when I was going to college from sophomore, junior, senior year, at that private girls' Jewish summer camp. Um, and it just exposed me to a different way of thought in life and just to be more open to all, everyone because again even I hadn't even seen a Jewish person I mean that's how bad I mean that's how crazy can you imagine but that's what it was like um, so even that exposure changed my life I think right so just getting out and having that exposure um, after I graduated college I actually moved to DC myself and I knocked on doors for a group called Maryland Citizen Action and worked on the Clinton Gore campaign in 1992 um, which taught me about rejection and how to go out and ask for money, which has now helped me, as we'll get into later in life, uh, uh, with activism. And so it was just an interesting time period there, too. And that's when I started to be like, oh, my God, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. I mean, I have to figure this out. Like, it's just hitting me, you know. And I was more of in a, more of a liberal sexing environment where I finally was like, okay, we've got to start to deal with this. These feelings have always been there. But let's just, like, really walk this through and what that means. Um, so it really came out probably around 24, very late in life. Um, but, but again, always knowing, always having those feelings, always having a crush on the best friend, never really got into a romantic relationship or guy more than three months. It, so it was, all the signs were there, but I just didn't feel comfortable. I think it was going into that kind of environment, a bigger city that offered me an opportunity just to be exposed, not just to LGBTQ people, but uh, in, to black people, to Jewish people, to people from different nationalities. I was just such in a little white homogeneity bubble uh, in this cornfield in Kansas that it just really, really opened things up for me uh, once I was able to get to DC. And then two years later, I moved to New York and that, then forget it. Like then again, uh, here you can be purple and, uh, and walk down the street even during that time period and probably not be judged. Um, and then really got to open up an experience and go into to, to, to gay bars and really go in and, and, and experience that. I remember walking into my first gay bar, which was Henrietta Hudson. Uh, it's been around as a lesbian bar probably like 20 years. First time I walked in was 1995 at 25 years old. Scared, shaking, nervous, not understanding. Uh, and But immediately it was like, wait, wow, this whole, this exists, this makes sense. Wait, oh my God, like this, this I'm, I'm not alone, I'm not going to hell, I'm not weird, I'm not all these things that I grew up thinking were so off the mark and so not true. And that's why I believe that LGBTQ bars are our church. It's where our community comes to gather and kids all over the country are still walking into them and having that, typically that's your first experience because where, where are you gonna go to find somebody like-minded? Now maybe you could go online, but that didn't exist, right? Uh, maybe now you could go to a, a, an LGBTQ center. Well, they weren't a lot all, always, right? So that was your first exposure where you could walk in and socialize with people that were having, facing the same struggles, had the same issues, had the same fears, and also probably had the same background growing up where they felt alone and isolated as well and, and maybe didn't know how to label it either. So if, if you meet your, your family, your chosen family, and I'm still friends with a lot of those people I met at 25, they're still some of my best friends to this day. And they are my chosen family. That's lovely. And did you have to work to put aside what you had 
been taught faith-wise? I did, I did, and that took a long time. I think for a long time I rejected my faith, and, and, and I think that's interesting. And then I kind of came back to it. It took me a while. But for a long time, remember, because I was at church every Sunday, right? I mean, this was just part of my routine, and I was very faithful. And then I became more spiritual, and now I'm definitely, again, this was a lot of years ago, and definitely more spiritual than religious, but I definitely rejected it hardcore. Because it was more like, wait, you do not accept me, blah, 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 blah. And then I came back to it, and I started to realize, and I think it was really impactful and important when we were trying to get gay marriage passed. I'm jumping ahead, but, but, but there's tidbits that relate from the past that have shaped what I've done in the future. When we were looking in, 2000, in 2011 to get gay marriage passed in New York, where we had conversations, we're like, no, when we have a rally here in front of Stonewall with 5,000 people, we need a rabbi, we need a priest, well, not a priest, but a rabbi. We need religious figures, we need a minister. We need this, because that's always been the biggest argument still is to this day of why LGBTQ people aren't accepted around the world is religion. And I think I came back into it and said, okay, I don't have to necessarily be religious, but you know what? You can be gay and have God. And I led a lot of talks and a lot of speak speeches about that because I really think that that is the hardcore reason why that's, that's the fight, right? It's always been it's religion that makes LGBTQ people not being accepted. It's religion that says we can't do certain things. It's the religious freedom law that was passed in Mississippi last year. So if me and my partner would want to go in, we can be kicked out of a diner because they would say we're, we're you know, it's, not, it's against our religion. It's everything that is still being used against us today, even though we've gotten so many freedoms, it's all based on religion. So I, I wanna take that back. Just like we've taken certain other things back, we've taken back the word queer, right? The younger generation wants to be called queer. Again, growing up, smear the queer was not a term that I wanted to be called at, you know, in 1982 at 12 in Kansas in a cornfield. Now I own that, right? And the younger generation is owning that back. And I think it's okay that if we go back and kind of own religion too. You can be gay and have God. We were all made this way. Or you can be spiritual. You can be Buddhist. You can be Jewish. You can be Muslim. I've met every single LGBTQ person, every single faith you could ever imagine. And I think that you, you, you got. If we're going to win this struggle, we have to learn to to our, um, articulate that you can have and be both. And we are part of God's children. We were born this way. We were made this way. And you've got to stop that from happening, right? So I think that's a really big important factor. Um, I have friends that have, you know, their parents were so religious, they put them in conversion therapy, religious conversion therapy. So that's scary. Uh, I was lucky my parents didn't do that to me. Um, but the coming out process, even then at 25 when I was living in New York, I got, you're going to hell. I thought I was a good mom. I wish you were never born. Now my parents are, are my biggest supporters and fans. But the same way it took me 24 years to acknowledge who I am, they had to come on this journey too. And I couldn't expect them with their background and where they're living and the religious values to be like, okay, that's great. Oh, you're gay, awesome, or you're lesbian, I'm gonna embrace you. Uh, they had to come on this journey and figure out innately how to work it out for them. And, and I think that I, that was a big lesson for me and I think it's a lot of lesson that I, when I'm having or mentoring young kids that are coming out to the parents, don't expect for them to get it. You took you 18, 19 years now, it's a younger generation, they come out much younger <laughs> to figure this out. So don't expect them to get that overnight and, and they will change. My parents, I never thought they would change. Now my parents have met my girlfriends over the years. Now my parents have you know, witnessed me do interviews and they'll be like, hey, I saw you on national TV, I'm so proud of you. And my mom will say, that's amazing. It's like, what'd you think about what I said? She's like, I don't know, but fix your hair. But that's a mom thing, that's okay, right? So, so they're, they're okay. So I think that, that um, that's an important element too, right? Of the whole entire thing that, that religion can play and then your faith-based family as well, they, they have to come on those journey. So. I interviewed a man who said his parents fought with him every day for two years. And then they just never got tired of fine. Yeah. And, and I think for me, like I said, that was the biggest thing. And, and, you know, and then for a while, I think my mom took the approach, you know, from 25 maybe to 27 of, of me being in New York and struggling. I came here, no money, no job, and my parents don't have money. If I was not going to make money in New York, I would be begging on the F trainer back in Kansas. Like, they were not going to give me a dime. They've never had my whole life. They didn't have it. Not that they didn't love me. They just never had it. And it wasn't because I was gay. So that's a whole separate issue. But I feel like that struggle, so I'm struggling in New York trying to make it, and then my mom was like, okay, she would, we would still talk, but then she kind of came into it. And it was about a two to five year period. It's like, love the sinner, hate the sin. I love you as my daughter. I will have conversations, but I will not talk about 
your romantic life at all. And it was just something I couldn't talk about. And even when I went home, and still till recent time when I would go home, I was not allowed when I went back into that world to have conversations with the aunts, uncles, cousins about being LGBTQ. And I would say to my mom, I said, I'm pretty sure I'm like 40 years old, never been married. And again, this is eight years ago even. They probably know something's up, right? So they probably suspect, never brought home a guy. I, I, I'm pretty sure they know, mom. But, but she just felt like in her world, that was her world. And that could wreck her world. And she was always fearful that, and, and, and it could have. And that's why I never would, when I went back, I was still very cautious. I would not go back in the closet, but I would just keep it, I would certainly not have conversations because at that point, especially from 30 to 40, when I was dating, you know, really entrenched in relationships, I wouldn't bring my partner home because again, different time period, right? And I think going into those small towns, that could have wrecked her life. Then the church is like, oh, don't invite Betsy. It was still that, that kind of thing. Or, not, or they could have a cross burning in their yard. I think those are really key, important things. I think also jumping back, um, it's interesting also when I was a sophomore in college, 45 minutes from my house, I think this also shaped me as an activist and also was like, oh my God, be careful in this part of the woods is where um, the Tina Brandon uh, story happened. You know, so literally, Falls City, Nebraska, the town where my grandmother was from and where my mom went to high school was the town where Tina Brandon, um, uh, um, you know, if you know the story and the famous story from Boys Don't Cry and all that, the, the Oscar award winning movie was based on, was murdered. Um, and it was literally a town that I spent a lot of time in as a childhood. So that makes you want to recoil and go back in the closet because then in your mind around, you know, I think that happened, I'm going to say 94. Four, don't quote me on that but it was around the early 90s when I was figuring this out and about you know coming going to DC and when I would come home it's like okay if you come out you die I mean that was literally in my mind because this is this is what happened um, and this was something where the whole town um, it was whispering and talking and not sympathetically right and then actually interesting enough the the um, the sheriff of that particular town that was the one who made sure that Brandon stayed in the wrong jail cell, made sure. Hang on, wait a second. Hi. That's okay. Hey, don't worry. <laughs> Um, th that made sure that, that Brandon was in the wrong jail cell and all those things and made all the wrong judgments that ultimately probably led to his life um, being lost, um, went to high school with my mom. So, so there was just all this kind of craziness that when I would go back there, uh, great place growing up, but that, that stigma and when you see that, so that's also in the back of your mind. Okay, if I come out, uh, okay, they kill people for being gay around here. You, you, would, you would think that, right? Uh, and again, 40, 40 minutes where, 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 I, you know, uh, where my home was. So that, that was just something that was also there, right? So, so for all those years when I would go home, I would remember that too. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to come out. I'm not going to wreck my parents' life. And I think I would have gotten more involved in ad advocacy and activism because I, 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 it's always been a passion. But I think I didn't do it because of them. Uh, I think I didn't do it earlier because I wanted my parents to be okay. Um, I wanted them not to be thrown out of their church groups or all these kind of things. And I waited till later in life to do something that I feel like is a purpose and a calling um, that I could have probably started earlier, but I was more in fear because of where I was from that that was not the right time. And how do you feel about that? Did you resent them for that? I don't think I resented them. I think it's all about the timing. Um, and then years later, the opportunity in, uh, you know, presented itself um, to, to buy into Stonewall. And so then I had the perfect vehicle. Um, so I think it all, I believe in destiny and fate, and I think it all lines up exactly the way it's supposed to, exactly the right time, and I think it was the right time. And by 2006, my parents were, were okay to a certain degree, and, and this was the perfect vehicle and the perfect opportunity to really take that activism to a whole new level. And, and that's what I've kind of done with Stonewall. Um, it was closed in 2006, and that's when my partners, Kurt Kelly, Bill Morgan, and Tony DeChico, along with a group of investors, all bought it. Um, so in every year I've gotten more and more bigger and more whatever I need to do in terms of the activism and the work and, and, and the focus on that. And um, I would be an idiot 
um, if I didn't use this as an amazing vehicle and platform. It's a, one of the most global recognized brands in the world. So I think I was not going to sleep on this opportunity, whether it hurt my parents or not. So tell me um, first about coming to New York and what, what were you doing before you got involved in uh -huh. Stonewall? Yeah, at first when I arrived in New York City, literally with everything I owned in the back of my car, no job, no place to live, uh, I subleased a place from one of the one of the cat friends that I knew on the Upper East Side was probably about the big, uh, as big as, I don't know, four shoe boxes, uh, maybe 300 square feet. Um, it was tiny and I, dirt poor and had nothing. Um, I went into a recruiting firm to find a job and because of my background in, in knocking on doors and, and sales and had done some telemarketing to pay through school and the fact that I had hired most of the most of the staff at the camp they're like oh my god you've got sales you understand HR and hiring you're perfect become a recruiter uh, and that's what I did and I, I had an amazing uh, career in recruiting uh, worked my way up I took two companies to the Inc 5000 typically placing people on Wall Street again knowing in my mind that uh, my parents, there's no safety net, and if I want to make money, I have to, to be my own person and do that. And, and I loved working recruiting because it was commission-based, so the more you put into it, the more you can make, and there's no cap. And for somebody like me who's hungry and, and knew it, um, it was an amazing career, and I got to run some amazing companies. And, and, I, and also, to me, at one, there was a social do-gooder aspect about it, because you found people jobs. I wasn't selling stocks or bonds or something. I, there's some kind of redeeming quality where you got to help them change their life in certain situations for the better. And that's always been something um, that I, even, you know, even if it, it's tied to, you know, even beyond making money and all that, that's really a, a core passion of who I am is I want that. And this provided that opportunity. And that's great. And so how did, how did you end up um, first investing in Stonewall and then getting involved. Yeah, sure. So during that time period when I was working on recruiting, I would always hang out at the bar down the street called the Duplex. At that point, the Duplex was owned by uh, Bill Morgan and Tony DeChico together. I'd been a customer there since 2000. Um, and Kurt Kelly was the manager, and he'd been there forever. And I became friends with all them. Um, after, interesting enough, um, Hurricane, I had a bar down south with my brother. I had a house down south with my brother uh, outside of New Orleans, and Hurricane Katrina struck. So during that time period, uh, my brother lost everything but the shirt on his back. The house was totally destroyed. We had a bar together called Spirits on the Beach, where I invested a lot of the money that I was making from there, trying to you know do something. And we had a bar together, a deli together, and a liquor store together. So it was probably the biggest loss um, for him, for me personally. We were actually at home watching it on TV because after my mom's brother had been killed in a car accident. So it was just this crazy story. But out of that disaster, for me, became Stonewall. Out of that disaster for him, he went back down and volunteered a few months later uh, met a woman and they had two kids. So out of you know out of this crazy disaster, he's got his his, uh, his son and daughter and, and I and I've got a life passion. So it's crazy. So that's why I mean my destiny and how it all works. So during that time period, after I became friends and after Katrina, I said when I came back, I was like I knew a lot of people that lost everything, including my brother. I knew that the Red Cross was doing stuff. FEMA was a disaster, as you know, and I knew a lot of people that worked in our our, our establishments, our deli or whatever, they didn't even have diapers for their kids. And it was the, the government, the US government was not getting there fast enough. So I, I decided to have my first ever fundraiser at Duplex. Um, I got a lot of people involved. I was able to pack a room like they have never seen before. I was able to get the corporate sponsors like the owners of Duplex have never seen before. So when the opportunity came and the bar next, and when Stonewall it had been run into the ground, no one had been in, you know, it's a long story, but somebody who owned it did not take care of it or make it part of the community. It was not a place where women were necessarily welcome. I had come in here and be like, a record would stop. Wait, there's a girl. It was just not, it had been run down. So when the opportunity was closed, they wanted to, to buy it, A, to clean up the block, namely because of the duplex, but B, because there was an opportunity for this. And they asked me if I wanted to invest. I said, absolutely. Uh, we had it for around two years in, and I started, and I said, absolutely, under one condition. Sorry, let me back up. I said, absolutely, but I want girls' nights in any nonprofit event I want, which they were great. 
So we started, I started doing our Thursday night downstairs night where I'd gather women for the first time ever to come into Stonewall. Once we got in here, the upstairs was completely not workable. We did not know that. So for the first two years, we really struggled to stay alive to the point where an opportunity came when they were like, hey, we're gonna have to sell or we're gonna have to maybe turn the upstairs into something else, we can't do this. And I said, okay, I don't have it, but I'll find it. And I bought more. I bought some of their, their shares and some of, the, some of that kind of stuff to, to do that. Um, and because I thought that was really, really important. And I think at that point they had seen that I was doing a good job and, I, and, and Kurt and I had been friends forever, right? So that helps. And he was the one who invited me in and the one who got me here. And I think he understood that uh, I was passionate about this and that was amazing. So that's kind of what happened there. So it was just an incredible opportunity to, to continue to do this. And so then I ended up uh, doing more and having our Thursday nights continue to be successful and then pass that on to somebody else. And I just started working on getting all the nonprofits in. I started a Tuesday night event called Stonewall Gives Back uh, again 10 years ago. And sometimes you would go in and I would do it for the Trevor Project. I would do it for... Um, HMI, I would do it for the human rights campaign. And we pick a different nonprofit every Tuesday. And sometimes the room would be full and sometimes there'd be five people. Literally, no one would be there. And it, I was just passionate about wanting to make sure that somehow that could stay alive. And I would always feel bad for our bartenders because they're making no money. Kurt, Bill, and Tony probably want to kill me. They're like, what are we doing? No one's ringing. This is not good. Uh, but we were able to parlay those relationships into huge events here that got massive people um, for, for fundraisers and work with HMI on, on, on doing different things and, and on hosting their prom every year, which is incredible to see the 17 years old being like, oh my God, I'm at Stonewall for prom. Who gets to do that? So uh, just yeah. for the record, so HMI is the Harvey Milk Milk Institute. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, Hedrick Martin Institute, Harvey Milk High School, yeah. So we host our prom every year and we did some fundraisers with them early on, like in 2008, around the 40th of Stonewall. Um, and then just started to work with different groups and having that happen, invite in nonprofits to have their events here, and then started going out and, and having conversations, and then got really involved with, um, you know, try, with marriage equality in, in 2010 and 2011, and got involved with a lot of different nonprofits, not just here at Stonewall, but outside the community, helping them throw events, helping them do this, and really using Stonewall as my way to open that door. Um, and, and so that was an incredible experience for me. Why my partners were here diligently, and mainly Kurt running the bar and keeping the lights on. My job was always out there in the community, making people aware that we were open, <laughs> making sure people were aware that we were being active, and that we're trying to preserve this legacy um, to, to you know for future generations. And we understand the history of Stonewall and what it means. And so we're out there being visible in the community at rallies, hosting fundraisers, political events, whatever it is, or even just LGBTQ bars passing out, you know, by cards sometimes like, hey, come to Stonewall, come to Stonewall, come to Stonewall, just because, you know, again, the internet not so big in those early years, right? I don't even think Facebook existed or, or just existed. So driving in traffic and foot traffic was literally a, a shaking hands, kissing babies, trying to get them in. Uh, and that was more my role by why I had nothing to do with the inside of the bar or the drinks or the staff, nothing. It was all trying to get people in the door and trying to work with different LGBTQ nonprofits and groups and, and, and the outside piece of it. Um, but, but it's been an incredible journey. So tell me about sort of how um, the clientele has changed. So when you opened in 2007, who was coming here at that point? I, I think it was uh, friends and family, right? And then, you know, on Thursday, I'd have a, early Thursdays, I would have like a girl night, and I would, I would email like 40 friends, and, and we would all come in, and that was it. And, and people that was interested in some of our crowd, and then also some of our regulars fr from that standpoint were, were um, older men that lived in the neighborhood. We've had Tree here, who was part of, uh, who was around during the time of the riots, and he goes and speaks to colleges and universities all over the world. He has been working at Stonewall um, for almost the past 30 years. So a lot of people would come in for him because he had his older guys that would come in, they'd known him forever, and uh, they literally paid our rent, right? Those, those few people that would come in sometimes. And then we started expanding and growing. It has changed so much, it's night and day. Um, I think that's because of the timing of the gay rights movement. We got very lucky, but I also think we worked our tails off to get ourselves acknowledged by the public and back out there. 
making sure that we were in the news constantly, um, making sure that when there was an opportunity, when something big and LGBTQ rights happened, to fight to say, no, you're having that rally here. No, you cannot have it at the center. I love the center. Or no, you can't have it at Washington Square Park. My job was to say, hey, I'm a part of your committee. I'll work, I'll get people, but you have to have it at Stonewall. And I think putting it back on the map and, and working with different organizations that blasted it in terms of that, and then and then luck and timing, let's be honest, in terms of what the Obama administration did. Um, and then working with the Parks Department across the street with the Obama administration to, to, to make the, the national park. So there were so many opportunities for us to get the word out. And I think we were very savvy about getting that word out that everyone was welcome. I remember a moment where we had a Golden Girls party that was a fun event and everyone dressed like the Golden Girls and it would be packed and, and, and Kurt and I looked around the room at one point and said, okay, this is what we want. It's gay, it's lesbian, it's trans, it's straight, it's black, it's white, it's young, it's old. This is Stonewall. And having that moment of like, we want this. So there was a very um, driven effort to get different pockets of the community to have an event here. Um, and then um, a couple of the guys were able to get the sports teams, and that was more Kurt and Mike. So that added a whole different generation of younger gay men that weren't here. We, you know, she was out speaking. I spoke at different colleges and universities as well, trying to get the, you know, once you're done, and working with NYU Law to have their stuff here, and trying to really get a whole generation to understand the importance of why this needs to stay a bar, why it needs to stay open, and the legacy and the rights that they have when they walk down the streets or why they can get married and all these things started at this place. And it's we kind of use it as a community offshoot where they can have events for free, where they can gather for free. And again, the mega church of the LGBTQ bars, which are such an important spot for our history and for our community today. So tell me about um, so some of the people who come here. Do Have you met people who were at Stonewall in June of 1969? I have. I've met, you, you, no, again, everyone says they were here. <laughs> so it's an interesting thing. I met some people who are like, people are like, Stacy, they weren't there. And then I met other people who are like, yes, they were really there. And then some people, I'm like, mm, you weren't old enough to be there. There's so many, it's interesting, there's so many urban legends and myths surrounding what actually happened, who was actually here. I think it's our job as kind of the innkeepers, right? And we like to call ourselves the innkeepers of the history to be educated on, on this kind of stuff. So the insights that we could provide on that was like, mm, there's some people that definitely weren't here. But yes, I've met people that were here and it was fascinating to hear their tales. And then I've met certain people that were outside on the street that didn't come in or people that were during that time period. Um, I think Tree is a walking historical thing and I've heard his stories. Um, I think he was, you know, around and definitely in the village during this time. I've read, uh, you know, David Carter's Brooks on Stonewall. So I started, I've gone on the History Channel and talked about Craig Wildwell and everything that he did afterwards. So I know the characters. I've met people that, that have, are here. But I think some of the, sometimes it's really hard to discern. And sadly, you know, there's not a lot of people left from that generation that were probably actually here. There are a few. There are a handful. And I've had the privilege to meet them and hear their stories personally, which is incredible to me. And that makes me want to continue this. I'll give you a quick tree story because I think it's interesting and important. And I'm using him as an example of, that, of a gay man during that time period that was around during that time period. Um, he had his, I think his 78th birthday. Uh, he's, he's probably in his 80, but his 78th birth, birthday. And I was talking to a gentleman who definitely in his 60s, probably like 50, 16 coming out when the Stonewall riots happened. So we talked about that a little bit and fascinating stories. And then I went and I talked to him outside for a little bit and he told me a story about how he was in Fire Island with, you know, 20, 30 of his friends, you know, that he had met that summer as a magical summer. And they, you, again, you didn't have cell phones, you didn't have the internet, how do you stay in touch? And they said, all right, let's make a pack. We're all gonna meet back in the city. Um, and this was, you know, during in the early 80s. We're all going to meet back in the city and get together and do, you know, a celebration for Fire Island, you know, a couple days before Christmas. He walked in and there was five others. Out of 20, 15 were dead because of the AIDS epidemic. That's how that ravished an entire generation. So I think 
the people that, the reason why, not just older age, and the reason why we don't have so many people that could articulate and were really around during that time period, I guess is my entire point in the story, is because the, the AIDS virus took out an entire generation of gay men. And especially during that age and that time period that would have lived through the 80s if they made it through. And hearing that story was gut-wrenching and thinking about, wow, and just hearing that firsthand sunk in a lot more than me watching Angels in America. <laughs> it sunk in a lot more air than the stories I've read about or, or seeing the quilt, you know, from Cleve Jones. So those firsthand stories, I think, are really important. And I want to make sure I share those with younger generations of people I come across because I think that'll keep us remembering the fight and the struggle and why it's we've made great strides and won battles the the culture war of us existing maybe is one and there's tolerance maybe is one but that's a whole different thing than advocating and we need our allies to be advocating not just tolerating and not just letting us exist we need advocating and that's the level we've got to get to and that's when we've won the war So do people come and talk to you about why Stonewall is important to them? Not not that they were there. Sure, all the time, all the time. I mean, and again, even younger kids. I've had people to come in, and sometimes I get letters through the nonprofit, the Stonewall Gives Back initiative that I run, and we'll get into that. But I've had letters, and, I, and when I've spoken or somebody finds me on the Internet about something I've said, where they're like, oh, my God, I did my, I did my high school paper on Stonewall. Oh, my God, I did a college thesis on Stonewall. Oh, my God, I couldn't wait to get off the plane from Europe. I ran into to some friends. I luckily was in Italy, and they said the first place I went was Stonewall. Was so, oh, my God, as soon as I walked in, I was like, oh, my God, this is – this is it, you know, this is why I have my rights, and, 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 and it's crazy. I'll never forget one, and particularly I had seen a, a, an activist from Uganda speak at the UN, and she was incredible. So I went up afterwards, I was like, oh my God, you should come to Stonewall. She's like, oh, I want to come, I want to come. And it, hearing her speak about, I mean, all these kind of things, um, and the atrocities that go on to LGBTQ people, in, in, not just in Uganda, but all over the African continent, quite frankly. Um, was incredible. Um, and then we got here and where I was upstairs and she's like, she's like, I'm not being weird. And, and she's like, can I dance with you? I was like, sure. And we're dancing or whatever. And, and she starts crying. I was like, oh God, now I was like, I'm all freaked out. What did I do wrong? I didn't touch you. I was just dancing, you know, whatever. What is going on? Why are you crying? And she said, she's like, because I could die in my country just for dancing with you like this, fast dancing, another woman with another woman. So it was incredible moving, and we just started hugging each other because it was just like, wow. And that was powerful to me. What an incredible experience to let that sink in, that just dancing and, and having, you know, and seeing somebody who just was more tears of joy of being able to have that freedom for the first time in their life just to dance with somebody else of the same sex. It was such an incredible moment um, that I got to hear, have here at Stonewall. A mecca of sorts. Yep. People come, came in huge numbers the day of, that marriage equality passed yep. the Supreme Court. They also came when the Pulse massacre yep. happened. Yep. Can you tell me about that? What's What do you think about kind of this role? I, I, I think we've tried to make it, and again, it, it wasn't always that way, but again, that's the gay rights movement. You know, in, 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 in before we got it on 2006, there wasn't a ton of stuff going on, um, but I think it was just a place that people weren't as aware of or as engaged in, and I think we've tried really hard to make it that place where the community comes to, to mourn, like they've done after Pulse. It's a place where the community comes to celebrate, like we did after marriage equality uh, in New York, and then marriage equality on a federal level, and then marriage equality even further, I mean, you know, defeated DOMA, and then marriage equality federally. So I think it's always gonna hopefully be that place, and I think we're getting the word out there to generations and through educational things and now through the internet and all these kind of things. And again, luck and timing, but I think we really made a conscious effort to work with those organizers say, no, you have to have it here, you know? And, um, and I think then with the Obama administration giving it, uh, you know, the blessing, so to speak, of, of saying like, all right, yes, and have that time period and having the leader of the free world recognizing this particular spot or the spot across the street but what happened outside of this bar um 
uh, as the first ever LGBTQ national monument goes a long way to say, no, this is the place. We, this is where the struggle began and, and you have to and you need to come here. And, and I think we've done a good job in educating the community about that. And I think for, I hope, our hope is for, for generations long after we're dead or long after we no longer own this, that it stays a, it stays a bar because I think it's essential for the community. And that's the history. Um, but there's always a place where that, you know, the, that street and that park is always a place where generations come to celebrate not just LGBTQ rights, but, but, but human, human rights and human things and human victories that we get within the, the culture wars of, of all of the others, right? When I say that women, minorities, immigrants, all that, and, and it becomes more of that kind of space. Um, you know, you know, President Obama, when he acknowledged it in 2012, when he you know, was reelected his inaugural speech, I was at a friend's house in pajamas watching it. We had like mimosas, and all of a sudden he says, "From you know, from from Seneca to Selma to Stonewall." I was like, "What?" He just said Stonewall in on in his inaugural historic speech. What? And my partners start calling. They're like, "The press is going to be there. Get down." I, I, tell my friends give me sweatpants i can't go in pajamas whatever <laughs> run down there um to be on tv to talk about that because it's what an important day the leader of the free world is finally acknowledging not not lgbtq rights and, and the historical importance that stonewall played and he put it in context with exactly how it should be the women's rights struggle in seneca and with the african-american struggle in selma so that was just such a key important turning point uh, for it's not just for the movement, um, for us uh, as activists, and even as us as business owners uh, who, who, who do, you know, need to make money to keep the lights on and keep it going. So that was just an historical turning point, and I think it's interesting um, that, that, that that particular time occurred, and I think that played a big point in it, too. And then from there forward, we really had the momentum to, to make sure we work with those organizations and make sure that everyone knew to sort of gather. I think my job, and I, I tell my partners this all the time, again, don't even know what, I couldn't even tell you the names of the liquor that we have, but my job is to make Stonewall a household name, and, and not the bar, but I'll use that as the vehicle, that every single person should know what it was, and it's a part of American history, and not just LGBTQ history. And my role, that's really my role through the, using this as a vehicle and through our nonprofit, is make sure everybody knows what happened and everyone knows why it needs to, to, to exist as a, a community gathering spot. That's really beautiful. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you, could you tell me about the um, Stonewall Inn Gives Back initiative? Sure. So after working with all these other nonprofits, and I think we've had hundreds of different fundraisers and events, we decided um, to start our own, mainly because we saw a niche um, again, because of my background growing up in rural Kansas, I really, like everything we talked about, knew what it felt to feel isolated, alone, and in a community where equality has not yet arrived, and where visibility of other LGBTQ people and resources are non-existent. And I see a higher suicide rate in those populations. I see a higher opioid rate, and, and especially in, in not, well, in small towns in general, but especially in LGBTQ um, people. And, and I see uh, poverty levels. So really looking at that, they said, well, let's really focus on using Stonewall and give, as a global recognized LGBTQ brand as a place to as using that name to raise money for grassroots organizations throughout the, the Midwest, rural areas, places where equality is slow to come. Our first thing that we did is we worked with the LGBTQ fund down in Mississippi because as I mentioned, it's the hardest state to live in if you're LGBTQ. They actually passed a law on the books in that state, the religious of freedom laws that could be passed in other places. Uh, also because of their you know, if you look at the history of what they did against, you know, racial rights, uh, it's just not a welcoming environment for anybody who's different. <laughs> so we wanted to go down and we started with them and, and funded with them. We were very lucky. We had some activists come up and speak. We were lucky. We had uh, Chelsea Clinton, who's been a big supporter of Stonewall Gives Back Initiative of us, came in and, and launched it here for us, which is incredible. And then our next kind of thing is we went into Independence Kansas and helped work with a group called Project Q&A to throw the first ever Pride in rural Kansas which was something obviously close to my heart because I think that was really, really meaningful visibility. There are other gay people in Kansas. They do exist down the road in a couple towns and all those kind of things. 
Then we also just recently partnered up with the Matria Foundation to send aid to LGBTQ people. They're um, in, in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. They're actually on the ground. They find women, especially trans women and LGBTQ people housing in general, but especially now after the hurricane, because what you see in a natural disaster, resources has become scarce. So the marginalized become more marginalized. So that was why we really perked, you know, and they're on the ground doing the work. So um, we had the executive director fly up for our annual uh, Pride event and, and, and talk about that. Um, I'm targeting places in, in, in Utah, uh, mainly because again, LGBTQ suicide is extremely high. And, and typically, we, I'm not gonna, I, can't, I don't wanna say it, but I will say it, it's probably because of the Mormon church. Uh, and that's been documented, so I'm not making this up. Um, but so, so that's an area that we're looking at. And also we want to probably work with some, a grassroots group organization that we've been talking to and targeting in inner city Detroit, another place. So we're really looking at using, again, our resources and our capability of the Stonewall Global brand and ability to raise funds and bring awareness to these campaigns and these situations to really make a difference in those places. They're the underserved communities. They're the forgotten communities. Uh, I would argue it's part of the reason Trump won. Uh, so we'll start with LGBTQ and go into those communities and try to show that we are making a difference on the ground and by using our name and our ability and awareness. And we're having events um, for the Stonewall 50 in San Francisco, Miami, and LA, and New York, taking money from these coastal bubble cities, kind of like Robin Hood, and funneling them into the middle where they kind of need some of these uh, resources, especially if you're LGBTQ. Do that? Do you have events here? We do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we've done here, so we've done a lot of different events here, and then we've got some amazing corporate sponsors. Obviously, JetBlue has a major hub in Puerto Rico, so they were very interested in partnering with us, and they've been a sponsor with us from the get. Um, so they've worked with us. Um, uh, we've also worked with Brooklyn Brewery, and we developed a uh, Stonewall in Wit Beer. Uh, that we had the last two prides with, um, you know, 50 cents of every pint going to the Stonewall and Gives Back initiative. We're about ready to launch it internationally with them. And uh, we changed it from a wit to an IPA, but it'll be called the Stonewall in IPA, and you'll be able to get it in Barcelona, Spain. So I'm excited about that partnership. Um, so lots of corporate sponsors, lots of events, lots of different donors. We've also are working with a select group through uh, another nonprofit called Pride Live, and they've been instrumental in helping us. Uh, their executive director, um, Diana Rodriguez, has been incredible. And we have Stonewall and ambassadors that are everyone from Cleve Jones, who's one of the biggest LGBT activists of all time, to Chelsea Clinton, to Anna Winter from Vogue, to Billy Porter, to actors, actresses, Amber Heard, anybody you can kind of think of in the LGBTQ world is signed up and will be helping us do events and a text to give campaign and auctions and things of that nature for Stonewall 50. That's great. So tell me some more about Stonewall 50. It's obviously enormous for the movement. Yep. But specifically for you. It's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us, um, as again, as keepers of the inn and Stonewall, to really, really, we're going to have the media, we're going to have all eyes on us, and we have an opportunity to really educate, right? Not just about Stonewall Gives Back initiative and not just about the movement, but, but what, what, what I want to call Stonewall 2.0. Where, are, where do we need to raise funds? What do we need to continue to do? How do we continue to keep even this bar open? What are the conversations that we need to be having now, 50 years after Stonewall, right? So those are the kind of conversations. And I think we're gonna have everybody descending. It's World Pride. We're expecting you know millions of people. But us here, particularly at Ground Zero, at the Stonewall Inn, will have an opera once in a lifetime opportunity to raise a heck of a lot of money, a heck of a lot of awareness, and do a lot of education just because we'll be at the center of attention. Uh, and again, I think, like I said, uh, once in a lifetime, once in a generation, uh, this will occur. And so we've been working for a year and a half, <laughs> realizing that, um, having meetings constantly, trying to figure out, make sure people can have events here, going to organize large events out front, obviously, working with all the major, uh, again, nonprofits and big groups that we can think of, including Heritage Pride, who does World Pride, um, to really make sure we can have that proper impact and not squander this opportunity Again, not just financially, yes, we would love for the bar to do well. We Again, we want to make money to keep it open. We, rent is not cheap, um, <laughs> knock on wood. So we want to do that, but more importantly, like I said, it's an educational teaching moment that will never come again for us. And what do you see, what are, what are, the, what are your concerns? 
concerns about the LGBT community, LGBTQ movement and I, I, I think there's a lot of concerns. I think what we're seeing is what we knew might happen, that when you get certain things, there becomes complacency, right? So when you get, you know, marriage, we thought that was the end. Well, a lot of people don't want to get married, right? So you've got to look at that. I think that trans rights is, is a huge thing. I think we're seeing fighting within our own community between gender politics and, 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 and same-sex sexuality, which are different things, but under our umbrella. I think that um, intersectionality and inclusiveness is really important, but I see that sometimes it divides our community. I think that a younger generation just kind of takes for granted all these things and that happened, that started here at Stonewall and that activists for decades have worked for them to have. And I don't want that to get lost. And I think that as we become more like that, we have to remember as a community that we have more in common than we do differently. And I think that that becomes something that I'm seeing lost, that, you know, well, if I'm Muslim and gay, I have this issue and this issue and this issue, and if I th have this issue and this issue and this issue, and it's everyone talking about it. And again, I, I believe in that intersectionality, but that's what it means. You all have to come together and be like, our struggles um, and our commonality are way greater than um, our, sometimes our identity politics that play differently than our sexuality politics, if that makes any sense. And I think that that's going to be a struggle that we have to, to work together to make sure that everyone's included, that everyone feels a part of this movement, that it's not just white gay men who typically make more money doing the funding and uh, other people, uh, I would always say that the lesbians do the work. They've said that for generations. <laughs> Bias. And, but I feel like that's really important. So we've got to make sure that people are in color are included, that trans are included, that we're all included, but we're not saying, well, my voice is bigger than your voice, and we've got to let those marginalized voices be heard and give up that opportunity too. But again, we can't, I see us bickering so much within each other that 99% uh, of the world's population is still not going to be advocating for us. 99% of the world's population does not accept us even. Um, so we need to stick together a lot more than we've been sticking together. And what about sort of the outside world? I mean, it's, we're, we're obviously living through this yep. hard shift to the right. Yep. What are we? What does that, how does that affect how you think about? I think it affects it a lot, right? And, and I think that, you know, I think that I worry, and I think we constantly have to be worried, and that's why the younger generation has to get educated and step up, because these rights could be taken away very quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, we want to think that, you know, at least marriage is law of the land. Uh, I don't know if Ka Kavanaugh gets in, if that's necessarily the case, right? So I don't know. Uh, I think that you, we've got to educate the younger generation that can be stripped, and we're seeing it stripped. It's being stripped away slowly and behind closed doors. Uh, the White House never didn't even recognize Pride Month for the first time ever. Um, you know, twice now during the Trump administration, we're seeing tra trans laws that you know that, again it's not making big public fodder because there's so many other crazy things going on in the world um, being stripped away. Um, through, uh, through DeVos and the educational system, right? So there's so many things that are happening that if we don't get that younger generation up to speed, that you, you, we can't be, this is not, this is certainly not the time to be complacent. It's the last time to be complacent because everything we work for could literally be taken away with an executive order with the stroke of a pen. And we have to be terrified of that. And, and again, it's not just us, it's all the others, right? So all the others, uh, whether it's minority, immigrants, women, all these you know, things need to come together and, and realize the inclusiveness of, of working together too. Um, and, and we've got to make sure, because again, I'm terrified for, uh, for what America could become uh, because the diversity makes us great. Uh, and, be, and LGBTQ is a part of that fabric of the American quilt. And, and, I, and I never want to see that uh, be stricken or be lost within that fabric. I want to turn us back to happier thoughts. <laughs> um, I was struck by it, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, and I've read you talk about sort of um, Stonewall and, and bars, more generally, yep. gay bars more generally, as kind of the gay church. Yep. So can you tell me a little bit more what you mean by that? I, because I think it's been the communal space. This is where... 
you know, when I talked about being young and going to Sunday, every church, you know, going to Sunday, uh, going to church every Sunday, this is a place where people would come every weekend, Friday and Saturday, for their community. It's where they found their chosen family. And, and, and especially early on, it was one of the few places you could walk into. Think about that. In 1969, people came here risking their lives, right, using fake names to sign in and all that kind of stuff because they needed to be around other people that loved the same way they loved. And I think the, the bars have always played, but fr from the beginning of the revolution here, right here, to so many other things and roles of building community, building friendships, because those were one of the few safe queer spaces where you could gather and feel like yourself. And that's how it's always been. And I think that younger generations need to understand that too. You didn't have Tinder, you didn't have Grindr, you couldn't go online, you couldn't go to your family. Where were you gonna find people? You knew that your neighborhood gay bar you were safe. There are other people like you. Um, and, and it's sewn into our history. And I think that's really, really relevant. And again, so if a gay bar is considered church of community and activism and where you meet your chosen family and where you come to identify and celebrate who you are, uh, then then Stonewall would be the mega church. I want to ask you a little more about the monument because um, one of the things that I'm interested in is you know, preservation is often about buildings that are beautiful. Yep. And not always, uh, not enough about cultural spaces that are important, whether or not they're, you know, important architecture. So, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what it means for you to, for this, this space and the park in front and the whole area to be a monument? I, I think it's incredible. I think it's because I think that cultural reference is so important and I think it's amazing. And there are other, yes, typically you would think of a, you know, some of our national monuments, but they're not always beautiful, right? The Grand Canyon is beautiful, but it's a, it's a hole, right? <laughs> but it's different, right? So I don't think it's just about the building or the architecture. It is about that, but it can be something of beauty. I think it, what this represents culturally is so significant to the history of Americana that it, to have it is just unbelievable. Um, and for it to be the first ever LGBTQ national monument. But I feel like just like the Statue of Liberty that kind of plays homage to our, our immigrant past, this place, this park, this whole area plays um, a part of our history and it plays into the history of, of civil rights, not just LGBTQ rights. I go back to that, LGBTQ rights is civil rights, right? So it plays into that. And it plays into that struggle of people, of, of, of Americans not having acceptance, not having freedom. So it's the same kind of things that you would see um, at other maybe national historic monuments um, in itself, whether it's like a Gettysburg or something that symbolizes that. So to have it the first ever national monument, I think was an incredible task by the Parks Department, uh, something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. Let's get that through. Uh, the Obama administration, the right political figures in New York, it was just all the stars aligned with a lot of hard work. Uh, we were kind of involved with them from the beginning or clued in and having conversations and meeting with Secretary Interior Jewel when they first came to talk about it. And I got to give her a tour of the space and, and all those kind of things. So I think culturally it represents a shift uh, in what monuments can be. And, and I think that's really important. And I think hopefully that from now on we'll look at other places that represent other things for other minorities and other communities that have struggled um, that need to be, their story needs to be told and saved for generations as part of the Parks Department and as part of, it, of the National Monument. Thank you. So I want to ask you, um, when you think about your own life and the, the community that you grew up in and, and how hard it was to even think about who you were or what might be. Um, and you and you think about the path you've taken so that now you're, you know, an essential spokesperson for Stonewall and the, and therefore the LGBTQ community. Can you sort of tell me your thoughts about it's that? It's overwhelming, yeah. It's overwhelming. I think the trajectory all began timed out exactly how it was supposed to. I think the fact that I... Um, I, I grew up the way I did, has played a huge role in it. I'm able to talk to, to faith-based organizations, cause been there, done that. I'm able to talk to people in real communities because um, I understand that. So I think it's given me I am an incredible 
viewpoint and an interesting background to be able to talk on LGBTQ rights. So I think that, that all of it has come together. Uh, sometimes I'm like, well, how did this even happen? This little kid from a cornfield in Kansas uh, gets to go on national television and talk about things that affect the entire gay community separate than Stonewall. Um, so, so it's overwhelming, but I think it's been um, something that uh, predetermined, predestined, and I think when some of your skill sets falls in love with your passion and your purpose, and it all combines, uh, it's just been an incredible journey. Uh, overwhelming, uh, a lot of responsibility, I gotta be honest, I don't take it lightly. I take it very seriously, and my partners take it very seriously to keep this bar alive. Um, it's daunting, um, but what an incredible journey, and I feel blessed and lucky every day that I get to do it. Uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. And do you feel um, like you, what kind of connection do you feel to the little girl you were? In your little I, well, I think, I think I constantly feel that connection because I think a lot of the work I do, I do for that little kid in that town. And I do for my 12 year old self because I know what that was like. I never, ever, and the reason why monetarily I sacrificed a lot and took a huge risk keeping this alive when I didn't even have the money. Um, and, and personally, I, I've taken a huge sacrifice. Um, and then professionally, you know, giving up some of the recruiting and a lot of uh, opportunity to make a lot of money to focus on activism, uh, that's always there. That I never want somebody to feel isolated the way I did, even though it didn't outwardly show. I never want somebody not to know who they are, not to understand what love feels like not to um to be that kind of that little kid in kansas who didn't know what it was just knew i was different and just have that turmoil everyone should be able to have the resources the visibility and the ability to come out and i think that constantly drives my main driving focus and why i wanted to really get when i had the opportunity to kind of start a nonprofit that i was going to steer with my partners through here that's where i wanted to focus because that's always been my reason for activism i never want any little kid to feel like i did at 12 years old in kansas is there anything else you want to tell me before we say goodbye no i i, I just you know thank you thanks to the center for doing this and i would encourage everyone who will maybe see this one day to stay involved to remember the fight's not over and to get involved in any kind of nonprofit and giving back and activism you can because I assure you, you will get back more uh, than you're giving. I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. Good? Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> really, thank you so much. Good? Okay.